So, the Lydian mode, what is it and why should you be playing it? Well, it's a scale and it sounds cool, so that's why you should be playing it. Uh, but there's a there's like a difficult way to look at the Lydian mode and there's an easy way. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna start with the easy way. And um, basically, the Lydian mode is a major scale. It sounds like major with one exception. And that's one note, it's, it's the raised fourth. But you can think of it as a chord note. So like a, a lowered fifth. Because if we have a major chord, we have three notes, the one, the three, and the five. And this Lydian mode, the whole point with it is that the fact that we have this sharp or flat fifth, which is so close to that chord note. That's why it sounds right and wrong at the same time. And that's how we get that kind of bittersweet Lydian sound. Uh, so, you know, if this doesn't make sane, sense yes, uh, yet, just stay, stick with me and it'll make more sense once we start playing it. Oh, you prefer the kiss method. Hmm, that's a cool one. Should I be rolling my tongue then? I don't know. Uh, Painkiller, what's up, my man? Okay, so, what I've been saying now for the last 30 seconds <laughs> is that the Lydian mode basically sounds majorish, but not quite, okay? So, it makes sense to start with, like, a major scale. Or even easier and better, let's start with a major pentatonic scale. If you've ever played the pentatonic scale, then you're going to recognize this shape. So we're going to be playing a super familiar pentatonic or major pentatonic shape. And by simply adding one note to this, we're going to be getting that Lydian sound. And it's going to be a whole lot easier than memorizing a whole kind of Lydian mode scale box. Okay, so let's start with a C major pentatonic scale. If we're hearing the note C uh, as a bass note on the 8th fret, uh, we could play this kind of shape. And you can find this scale diagram if, the, if you click the link in the description. So we're doing a standard pentatonic shape, which is the exact same shape as the A minor scale. But since we're hearing the C note, we're going to be perceiving this note as a major sounding scale. 8, 5, 8, 5, 7, 5, 7, 5, 7, 5, 8, 5. So there we go. Okay. How on earth are we going to make this sound Lydian? Well, you could start by playing a Lydian harmony. And that is the reason why I provided you with a Lydian sounding chord. So I just gave you one. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them out there. You can, but just to get you started. Uh, so again, if you check the link in the description and scroll down a little bit, you're going to find this kind of chord. C note there, and then. Uh, we're going to be playing on the 9-9 nine, nine there, on the D and the G string. First of all, we're skipping the A string, right? So... And then... So there you have it, that's a Lydian kind of sound. Oh, I get it. <laughs> Keep it simple. Sorry. So there you have it, uh, the Lydian... Lydian sounding chord I gave you. So if you have this as your basis, you can play this pentatonic scale. Whoop. But you can make it sound even more Lydian. And we're going to do so by adding this note, the seventh fret on the B string. Again, check the link in the description. You're going to find the second scale diagram uh, shows you where exactly where this note is. But if you know the, the major C major pentatonic scale, uh, you can quite simply add that note here. Right? And then we're just gonna keep going down. Okay, too good to be true, isn't it? But you are in fact playing the Lydian sound here. You're not exactly playing the Lydian mode, and that is a very good thing. You don't want to be playing the Lydian mode, uh, because usually when you play the Lydian mode for the first time, it sounds something like this. Something like that, and it's kind of boring. Uh, what I just gave you is so much more musical. Why? Well, because it emphasizes all the strong notes over a major chord, uh, because the C major pentatonic has pretty much only strong notes, and it emphasizes that one note, the sharp fourth, which is so typical to the Lydian mode. 
So, even though we're not playing this rather uh, complex um, Lydian uh, scale box, we're not doing that, we're just doing... Uh, we're just playing this kind of uh, variation of the pentatonic scale. Uh, we are still definitely nailing the Lydian tonality, and that's what this is all about. And to me, the most important to get started with uh, playing modes is to hear how the mode sounds, what is typical to this mode. The rest is actually easy. A lot of people start the other way, way around. They start by memorizing different scale boxes and it becomes like a memory game. And then I get the question quite often, how do you memorize lots of scales? Well, you know, if you're struggling with memorization of scales, then that probably means you learn the scale wrong for the, from the beginning. But if you do this way and you learn to hear, ah, okay, well, I know what that pentatonic scale sounds like. So if I add this note, I can hear how it changes the sound of the pentatonic scale. That's a super efficient way to actually start hearing what the, the mode is all about, as opposed to memorizing where to put your fingers, right? Um, so painkiller, we're not actually replacing any note in the pentatonic scale. We're just adding one more, so it becomes like a hexatonic scale. Um, so uh, this would be the pentatonic scale, right? And we're just doing this. That's the only difference. Okay, one more time, pentatonic scale. And we're doing And then if you want to, you can add the same note in the next octave, but I, I didn't bother because I just wanted to keep it simple, but you can, this note is down here, so you can, if you want to, but you know, it's, it's, we don't really have to do that now because as I said, this is all about learning to hear uh, the difference. And I think it's easier to hear it here uh, on a, like a top melody note. Um, Okay, so good question there by Duke. If I'm not playing the Lydian mode, what mode are you playing? I'm not really playing a mode. I'm playing, if we want to get theoretical, we can call it the major hexatonic scale, but you know, who cares about those names? What I'm doing is I'm emphasizing that one note. So basically the scale I'm playing is all part of the Lydian mode. So if I were to add two more notes, I would have the Lydian mode. So there's almost no difference in terms of theory. But in terms of fingering, it makes a huge difference. So just to showcase this, if I were playing standard Lydian mode, I would be just be doing... So... Basically, I would just add... Uh, that note. <laughs> Yeah, so just add this note and you get the Lydian mode. So there's almost no difference, sorry, it's just one note different basically. But the, the major difference is in how you visualize the scale, that's the whole point of it. So I visualize it differently because I'm starting with the pentatonic scale. And the reason I'm use, doing that is because most people know the pentatonic scale while most people do not know the Lydian mode. So to make it easy for you, rather than just to show you this classic Lydian mode box, I'm starting with something you are hopefully familiar with. And if you're not, it's a good idea to start with the pentatonic scale. That's a good starting point. So if you weren't familiar with the pentatonic uh, scale from before, then you can hopefully see this as a catalyzer to start checking that out because then you've learned that, aha, uh -huh, then I can just add one more note and I'll be playing the Lydian sound. Exactly, that note is the sharp fourth. So uh, the only note I'm skipping here is actually the major seven. So if we add the major seven, we get the whole Lydian mode. Cool, you like my tone, that's awesome. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of time to digest all this information. We're gonna keep going, but while you try this out and while you think of it, I'm just gonna jam one more time over the same Lydian backing track so you kind of get the sound of the Lydian in your head. So this is in C sharp Lydian. So uh, we're gonna be moving all those scale diagrams up a half fret. Doesn't really matter for you to perceive the sound of the Lydian mode though. 
a hoe. Uh, my brain. Bittersweet Lydian Samba. I love it. There we have it. That's the sharp fourth. That's the one I've been showing you. Okay, so um, if you have any questions or thoughts, or, well, you've done a good job so far, so just keep those questions coming. Um, so now we're going to proceed and we're going to look at a more advanced way to play the Lydian uh, sound again, while still avoiding that super classic... Uh, well, Lydian mode shape, which I find kind of uninspiring, you know, the, the standard way you would learn the modes. Uh, and I know a lot of people are strugg struggling with that, so I figure it might be good to offer an alternative way of doing it. Okay, so what I like to do in a major context is to play the major 7 arpeggio. This arpeggio uh, is a bit like the major pentatonic scale, uh, except it doesn't have penta 5 notes, it only has 4 four notes. That makes it a little bit harder to play, but it makes it very rewarding sound-wise. You get a very cool sound when you don't play as many notes per octave. Um, so, we're going to be playing now again, move, move back to C major. You can hear that Lydian chord as our basis. And over that, I would play the C major 7 um, arpeggio. So again, you can find the scale diagram to this if you click the link in the description. So basically we have this. You can hear it's a kind of special sound there. So that's the major 7 arpeggio. If you haven't played that arpeggio before, I can recommend it. It's a really cool arpeggio. Uh, you can play fast with it, though it's not your typical like sweep picking thing. Um, but most importantly, it gives you some very cool intervals to work with. And if you want to add some even uh, cooler uh, kind of sounds to it, well, that's why we're here today, because we're going to add that Lydian sound to the major 7 arpeggio. So instead of playing it the way I showed you, that's going to be the third scale diagram in the link in the description. And I'm just going to double check that I'm giving you the right information here. Yes. So if you check the third diagram there, which says advanced method, and then it says one, start with a major seven arpeggio. Uh, that's where we're at right now. Here you have it. So we're going to be adding one note here, and again, it's going to be the sharp fourth, uh, and there you have it. And this time around, however, since we have n not as many notes to play with, we are going to feature that uh, note in the next octave as well. So we get... There we have it, really nice. Hey Bia, what's up? We can definitely try a three octave shape. Sounds awesome to me, you know? <laughs> ah, 
Okay, so uh, how would we do that over three octaves? Uh, this one is actually kind of easy to play. So you would just, uh, well, you can do it many ways, but. You can actually just move down one note uh, and play that shape you get in three different octaves. But that's a bit uh, beyond what I was going to cover today. Uh, I think it's good enough if you... Um, well, if you've never played the Lydian mode before, I would wait with this concept and do the first one I covered. If you have, uh, if you are comfortable with the major pentatonic scale, then I think this could give you some good uh, food for thought and some um, a good challenge, basically, uh, because you would not only force yourself to get a bit more familiar with that major seven arpeggio, which is super cool, uh, but you could also start adding that magic Lydian note in uh, arpeggio context, which is really cool. Do it in A flat, A flat Lydian. Whoa, almost right. There you have it, A flat. Um, okay, so, um, well, uh, I'm again going to give you some time to get familiar with this shape and just for the hell of it and since I don't like playing over the same backing track all the time I'm actually going to switch to a Dorian backing track now. We're going off topic obviously but uh, you could see this as an interesting um, challenge to your ears. Can you spot the like a, a clear difference between whoop, a Dorian sounding backing track and a Lydian, because I'm going to be doing some Dorian now. Again, it has nothing to do with the lesson. I'm just not going to be playing over the same backing track all the time. That's going to bore me out. So I'm switching to a Dorian backing track while you digest what I've been doing. And we can see if you can hear a difference. What notes do you usually bend? I like half-step bends, they're easier. So in a Lydian context, I would bend from the sharp fourth up to the fifth, that's a classic thing. Or from the major seven to the root note. Now I'm playing in, in the Dorian kind of thing, so I'm bending from the major six to the uh, minor seven. But you know, I like any bend that is up to a strong note, that is, so may, uh, minor seven to the root note. One off the fourth to the fifth. And then you can add that. If you nail the right note. You can add the minor six. With your uh, pinky. Or, uh, why not to the like the my the minor or oh, the second to the minor third? And then back to the root. Really cool. Uh, you could do that like a one and a half step bend, so <laughs> you could, if you knew how to. There we have it. So there you have it. So uh, like, uh, I'm starting with a whole, whole full bend from the root note to the second, and then while I'm up there, I'm bending a half note up to the minor third, and it's really cool. Or you could do that pinky thing. So many cool opportunities. And I'm gonna do that fourth to the fifth again up here because it's a bit easier. So now I'm bending from the fourth. And I'm adding that minor six up there. 
So basically the way to look at this is try to bend from any note. Uh, a good starting point is to aim for a strong sounding chord note. So if you know what the chord notes are, that simplifies things, but it's not a necessity. Actually, I would say it's better to not know them <laughs> and to train your ears. That's what I've been doing all the time. Just play, and if it sounds bad, keep playing until you land on a strong note, and then you can experiment with bending there. Of course, you know, if, if you're playing like standard blues licks, then actually I think it's more the fingering that's going to dictate whether you're bending or not. So for example, this kind of thing, you're pretty much bending all the notes that uh, happen to be played with the ring finger, because it's easier than to bend with the index, right? So that just goes to show that you should really experiment, and a lot of times those classic blues bands, they were done because... Uh, of convenience rather than like musical intuition. Again, it's easier to bend if you're, you know, with this finger than with the index finger. By the way, thanks a lot for the great words uh, about my tone there. Uh, I'm uh, using the Kemper, and uh, for today I started off with a uh, like a 69 kind of Marshall amp or profile uh, by Michael Britt, who does a lot of my favorite profiles. Uh, and I tweaked it quite a bit to get more uh, like sustain and a bit more um, top end. <laughs> Actually, I did something uh, that works kind of well for high gain, uh, pro, uh, high gain sounds. I cut the, the like the bass part of the sound. I removed some quite some bass uh, before the signal hits the the um, the amp, and then I can add some of the, the bass afterwards. So if you have a chain, um, uh, typically if you have like a digital uh, modeler, then it's easy to decide where you're gonna put the, or it's it's easy to change where you put the EQ. So basically in the beginning of the chain, you cut your uh, bass and you add some treble, and then at the end of the ch chain, you compensate for the lack of bass. And uh, the reason this works well is because when the signal hits uh, the preamp, uh, uh, you don't have all those like muddy bass frequencies that react very differently to your picking and all that. So you cut that away and you get a very fast reaction from your picking. Then of course you don't want to end up with a thin sounding tone, so it's a good idea to sort of compensate for that at the end of the chain. I just thought I'd, uh, I'd tell you that. I don't know why. Okay, so since we're jamming, let's try some more. I'm just gonna grab some, some random jam tracks here and see if they work. So I can just show you, I'm just uh, grabbing some backing tracks. I don't even know if this is a cool one. I don't know, just give me a second. Well, this is just bass and drums, but it's kind of cool. But I want something else. Let's do epic guitar phrases. This could be cool. There we go, E minor, love it. Love it. 
So here I'm back with my face. So if you guys want to join in, this one is easy. It's in the key of E minor. You can play your trusty E minor pentatonic scale. Um, cool question there. M. Phony about the pots. I'm definitely going to answer that one. Just give me a minute shredding and then I'll get back to you. <laughs> you know, I just got started. I need my cake. I guess that'll do. <laughs> so, uh, I should say I haven't got a guitar with a P90 yet. Uh, the closest is actually like, uh, I have a... So uh, this guitar actually has, uh, that's like a P90 plus a single coil. I don't know if you can tell. Uh, this is a was a desperate attempt to save the the tone. It, it has it's a really nice guitar, but it's the tone is very special because it's all maple and graphite fretboard. So I've done a lot of pickup swaps with nothing really worked out. However, that's my latest one. But uh, that's just to say I haven't really got P90s in any guitar right now. Uh, but the thing is. Uh, I would experiment with that because uh, I'm actually open for trying uh, like 250 pots on a like a humbucker. Uh, I think a lot of people would argue against that, uh, but I, it takes the edge of the basically takes uh, some treble off the tone. And uh, I think a lot of people argue that, well, you could just turn down the tone knob and then you have the option of turning it up again. <laughs> well, you can't do that with 250 pots. Uh, so, uh, but with a P90, uh, it might be worth trying, you know, it's, it has more of a single coil character. Uh, but uh, I'm all up for experimenting with that. Uh, I like to, well, I, I like softer tones, but I think that uh, in the end, you can, even with a bright tone, you can get um, some warm sounds out of it, both by turning down either the volume knob or the tone knob, or depending on the setting you have on your amp. So. It's a bit limiting if you can't get some treble off from your guitar at all. That's harder to compensate. It's always easier to roll some treble off. And if that's the same way uh, my thinking goes for high output pickups. I'm not a fan of high output pickups because they kill your dynamics and you can never restore those dynamics. However, if you have like a low output pickups, all my guitars have super low output pickups, uh, then what you can do is you can always add a booster later on. So unless you're really playing, you know, the, the, the most chuggy metal there is out there, then I think it's, it's more wise to go for like a medium hot or even not so hot pickup. And that's the same kind of thinking. You don't want to limit yourself. So that's probably what I would say about that. You can probably get better answers from someone who actually has real P90s. <laughs> Epic guitar phrases. Oh, this one I remember. That's actually a lesson I did a while back. <laughs> Called Your First Phrases. But this has a cool backing track. Ooh, that's groovy. Okay, let's try this. So E minor.
By the way, uh, I'm gonna give you all the backing tracks, uh, the links, so you can check them out for yourselves. Uh, these backing tracks all have, or, or these lessons all feature free backing tracks. So, uh, you, you know, you can have a lot of fun when the session is over, just jam with them. Uh, where am I now? I'm just gonna try to find you guys again. Cool. So just shoot if you have any questions. Um, I've covered pretty much what I wanted to do in terms of the Lydian mode. I think the information I've given you is actually more than enough uh, for a lot of people to, you know, work on for a long time. Uh, so again, it doesn't really matter if you're kind of new to the Lydian mode, mode and you want to start exploring the sound of the Lydian mode using this pentatonic scale as your basis, or if you already knew how to play the, the Lydian mode and you want to get more adventurous with that, uh, that major seventh arpeggio kind of concept. Both methods are fine uh, and you, you, know, you should definitely have a lot of fun with them. So I'm just gonna keep jamming on this one because I actually love this backing track. I haven't played it for a long time, but I, I remember when I recorded the lesson, I was totally thrilled by it. And it's actually not my backing track, it's by another instructor. Uh, it's, uh, if I remember correctly, it's Diego Budisins, uh, amazing player from Italy. So I just shamelessly borrowed his backing track to make this kind of jamming lesson. So here we go, let's try it some more. By the way, I'm doing a lot of shredding here. If you guys are into any learning, any kind of shredding or techniques, uh, just give me a shout. I could break down something, of, uh, you know, to, if that could inspire you to practice. John, that's no small thing to say. Oh, sorry. Shameless joking here. Pun intended, that's what you're supposed to say. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is like more like funky playing. I don't know if you guys are into that, but I love it. You know, the kind of thing we do. You don't even have to play any fancy notes, right? It's just about the timing, right? I'm just playing um, nine to seven on the D string, like this. Thank you. 
And it sounds kind of cool because I'm doing like de- 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 swing and kind of phrasing. Uh, and the, and then of course it's kind of self-explanatory. If you start adding more notes up on that, uh, it might even sound better. So. Sorry, I don't understand your language there, but uh, thanks for tuning in. That's all I can say. And okay, Duke, so shredding for next year. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, you don't know, you know, there's uh, it's not like you either play slow or you either play fast. It's like, uh, uh, the, you know, you can always work on your technique to get more flexibility and, and it doesn't have to be extreme shredding. It could just be uh, a matter of improving your technique. Um, okay, so... That's a really cool backing track. Let's see what else we have. Uh, I'm gonna explore a little bit here. You can see I'm gonna go for the Dorian phrases here. Let's do... This is also kind of groovish, Greg Howe something, maybe sounding backing track. This is faster, so it can be harder to play with the groove. So it's E blues again. Yeah, that's cool, but it's hard. You know, this kind of thing, I think, is harder than it looks. You can always just do your... Play that, but, you know, if you want to play this with a bit of style, you really have to try to lock into the hi hat going. I don't know if you can hear that. Definitely a challenging backing track. Uh, again, I'm gonna give them to you once we're done there. Uh, let's just see if we can... Got to go now. Thanks for the lesson, I enjoyed it. You are the man, thanks so much, Duke. Thanks for the great words. Uh, so while we're jamming around here, let's see if I can just, I'm a bit, I'm a bit slow today. My brain is not keeping up, but here's a cool one, Dorian Funk. Let's try that. So key of F now. Mm 
maybe. Or no, B B Dorian, I think. how the master does it because I don't think a lot of people know about Jonathan but he's a really skilled guy and he did this like 10 years ago but it's still a fresh solo if I remember correctly let's see and this is all about getting the details right You can see how he nails those like semi harmonics there, it's really nice. So again at the end there, semi harmonic. Some shredding there. Pretty cool. So it's a super bass or kind of short but very cool uh, thing there. Uh, but what I was speaking about is he's, he's constantly doing these not quite like clearly sounding harmonics, but just semi sounding. So, and you need a little bit of um, strength in your picking hand to get that. Um, and it's good because it's not only the harmonics. Basically, when you hit the strings harder and you have a distortion on, or, or you have distorted sound, uh, you might uh, you might not hear a difference in dynamics, right? If you play with a clean sound and you hit the guitar harder, typically the, the note gets louder. But what ha what's happening is when you hit harder with distortion, you change the character of the distortion because you're sending something else into the amp. So it's distorting in a slightly different way. And uh, that's not something you might think so much about when playing. But if you record yourself, for example, uh, you can hear that um, the tone gets different depending on how hard you hit, even with distortion. So that's why it's a very good idea to actually experiment with your right hand uh, picking strength. And Jonathan is really, really good at that. He does that a lot here. You can see there? There. I don't know. Like that thing. So the notes prior to that, he was playing them with not a lot of dynamics there, but then he hit a bit harder at the end. And that's when, when you get these interesting overtones that happen because of what I explained with the louder dynamics. And also he lightly touches um, the, the string with uh, his thumb. So we get those semi harmonics, really cool. So I urge you to check this one out. Um, this is a pretty cool, cool one. Deja Vu Guitar, what's up my man? Awesome to have you here. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty cool lesson right there. Uh, let's just jam a little bit more of the backing track. You can join me, key of B minor. So what did I do? Oh, there we have it. Fade 
face is back. <laughs> there you have a lot of those kind of semi harmonics there. Pretty cool there. Mm, so many nice backing tracks to choose from. I know that... Uh, uh, this is Dalton. He does really, really fresh sounding, uh, like fusion kind of stuff. And his backing tracks are always a challenge because he has a lot of uh, tonality changes. Let's see if there is one here. C minor to G minor. D. No, I think we're good. No, maybe. I don't know, let's try it. There's definitely a... Ah, uh, you see? I can't even do this. It's too difficult. So if you guys can play this, do let me know how, you're do how to do it. I'm gonna give you the link. Yeah, I couldn't play this one. <laughs> so I'm sure you can do it better. Uh, let's try another one here. So I'm just navigating now a little bit here. It's always cool to get inspiration. I'm checking the applied techniques now. Uh, I think, yeah, that's the one I was looking for. We have like under concepts there, we have applied scales, which is pretty cool if you just want to get inspiration for, you know, if you're working on something. So for example, if I'm working on Lydian, I can do that. Um, this is pretty cool. Seven licks in all C melodic minor mode. Seven licks in all C major modes. Should we try that? It's a bit easier. C, I, O, and D. So this is just gonna be, you can basically stick to the key of C major here. Yeah, this is, is good if you, if you're not comfortable with, you know, these faster, ba faster backing tracks, it's always easier with a ballad. And the cool thing with this one is, um, without realizing it, you're gonna be practicing the, the different uh, modes, how they sound, uh, even though you're just sticking to the key of C major, or you know, even like, you can keep it simple, think of it as A minor pentatonic. If I'm not mistaken now. Yeah, exactly.
Okay, relative minor scale now. So you can see I'm following the... <laughs> I'm cheating a little bit here. So I'm actually here now. And this is the last one, the Locrian. That's a hard one. And then we're back now to C Ionia or C Major. It's a good way to practice the most. So now D Dorian. Now E Phrygian, this is a tricky one. So if we can get crazy and do Phrygian dominant, which is not part of uh, actually the, it's not one of the modes of the major scale, so let's not do it. Yeah, that's a pretty cool one. Uh, so this, if, you, if you're more advanced, then you want to kind of explore the tonalities of all these different um, modes. This could be a cool lesson for you. I'm just gonna throw out the link to you. Uh, basically, again, you can you know you can play, you can read the text I was reading and just play the first backing track, and you don't have to you know sign up or pay or anything like that. So this is um, it's a cool one. Let's do something bluesier. Now this is a nice one. Let's try this one. G pentatonic major. Nice. I think this is a might be a good opportunity to turn down the distortion a little bit. guys want to join me you can actually think E minor here uh, you're gonna be playing the relative minor scale and it's the exact same notes so you can nice to throw in like a totally different style because uh, sometimes I find myself if I'm just constantly playing over like uh, specific backing track from a specific style like rock or metal I'll just play the same thing over and over but it throw in like a totally different backing track even if you know you mess up and you don't really master the genre 
it still tends to throw you in a different direction. So it's a good way to get inspiration. Uh, just as you would, you know, sit down and learn a song or a new riff or lick, whatever. You can just choose a new backing track as well. It's it's another tool. Um, so what should we do now? I don't know. Let's see if you guys have said anything. Or are you silent? Silence is total. Let's um, Let's see what more we can find. I'm just going to... Go in again, search a little bit here. Uh, speaking of, let's do, yeah, let's do something advanced. Uh, that's also uh, an old uh, lesson of mine where uh, I teach the concept of shred improvising. Um, this, if I remember correctly, is a nice backing track in D major, so let's try it.
by the way, a uh, bit of a shameless plug here, but uh, basically what I'm doing in this lesson is to explain the concept that goes on, the concepts that go on in my head as I'm playing this. So, hello there. If you're into uh, this so kind of stuff, we're going to speak about something I think is very interesting because it concerns most people out there, and it's probably that was when I used to have a Batman cap. You know, now I have a an old dude's hat. It's kind of different. I was young back then. <laughs> so I'd say the biggest problem among internet guitarists. Oh, I speak about internet guitarists. The way guitars. we deal with playing fast, um, and I think most people. Uh, out there are really working very hard on their speed whether they care to admit it or not that's so true um, i was wise in spite back then. of this uh, i personally think that much of the the you know fast playing you see on youtube uh, is pretty predictable uh, there's not a lot of variation happening uh, and um, it's almost never improvised <laughs> and um, that's me bashing everybody else i that's think a it's a shame cautious. because isn't it? just like slow playing fast playing can be improvised and that's what we're gonna discuss in this lesson uh, and it's basically my approach to playing because i feel like learning know, I from myself rely on improvisation whether i'm playing fast or slow um so i don't really make a difference between those two and Ooh, that's i want to help you well. look at it the same way come join me oh wow i'm tempted Oh, some heavy metal riffing as well. So first, a little bit of background. So just like so many other people, uh, I started I'm out see if you guys uh, are still torturing around. myself with a metronome. No one is here watching. <laughs> Only I me watching you know, myself. That's kind of long sad. practice sessions where I would have. Cool. This. No, but that's a nice one. Uh, I'm just gonna give you the link just because I started with this stuff. But no more links now. Um, back in the corner. That's where I want to be. Uh, and uh, yeah, there we go. That's the link. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, this was a really fun session. Um, and um, <laughs> I just keep laughing at myself. There, it's always fun to look back at what you what you used to sound like and what you used to play. Um, but um, we had a lot of fun, I think, exploring the Lydian scale. I hope you agree with me. And of course, we're going to be doing more of these. So you definitely want to hit that bell icon and you definitely want to follow me at GMC and on Facebook and all those nice places. Uh, and I hope to see you soon again. Cheers, mate. We have one last question, so I'm not going to end the stream. That's like, uh, you know, in a movie when someone gets saved, you know, in the last second before they fall off the cliff. That's just what just happened. Ron Snyder saved us. So you find it hard to memorize all the scales. That's a really interesting question um, because uh, basically, here, here's the deal. Um, a scale is usually just uh, like five or seven notes. So not a lot of things to memorize, but it gets difficult as you're trying to play those seven or five notes all across the fretboard. Because remember, we have 12 notes at our disposal, right? So uh, with a bit of math, you're gonna quickly figure out that if we only have 12 notes, that means a lot of notes repeat. And that's the same thing with scales, right? They are just like a few notes that repeat. Uh, and uh, you end up with having all these dots on the fretboards that are so hard to remember. But the thing is, um, if you are struggling with remembering these notes, you sort of have to go back to how you initially learned the scale. Did you just memorize the scale or did you learn to hear how the scale sounds? Uh, and I think there's a major difference between those two. And that's kind of the topic of this specific live stream, where I started off by showing you a super or kind of simple way to learn the Lydian sound. Not necessarily memorizing all the dots of the Lydian mode, but rather uh, starting out with a simple scale like the pentatonic scale and just adding that Lydian tonality. And what that does, uh, it tells your ears how the Lydian uh, scale or mode or, or sound, what it sounds like basically. And when you teach your mind and body and fingers how something sounds, remembering that sound is typically not a problem. Uh, 
On the contrary, if you understood how to make the Lydian mode sound Lydian, uh, then chances are you're gonna remember it for the rest of your life if you find that sweet Lydian spot. However, if you try to rush things and just memorize uh, where everything, try to memorize where everything is, like, okay, I know the Lydian mode, now let's do something else, uh, then yes, you are gonna struggle with memorization. So uh, my short answer would be, that was the long answer, the short answer would be, if you're struggling with remembering uh, scales, uh, then you've probably not learned them the right way. Uh, so if memorization is your problem, uh, then memorization is not your problem. <laughs> it's, it's rather uh, to uh, go back and uh, look at how you learn the scale starting from scratch. And uh, you're actually gonna find if you just go back like five live streams back where I explained the pentatonic scale, I, um, I actually go into this into detail and just explain, okay, so how do we move around the fretboard? Uh, what, do we memorize all these scale patterns? Or do we teach our fingers and our ears to make a connection with those notes so that we never ever again forget them? <laughs> and I would much uh, rather choose the, the, the later, right? I would much rather um, get like a personal connection with the scale rather than just quickly memorizing all the dots, dots and then trying to figure out how the hell am I gonna remember all of it? So again, the answer is pretty much in the question there. If you wanna be able to memorize scales, uh, you should look at how you're learning scales because memorization shouldn't be your biggest problem. <laughs> Wrong. So I'm glad you, it makes sense to you. Uh, you know, I think uh, this is my conclusion from, from getting a lot of student feedback uh, that um, I think there's a misconception. You, you have to learn something so you can play it quickly all over the fretboard. And, uh, you know, you can... If you learn it the method I suggest, you're definitely gonna be able to play it all over the fretboard as well. So there's no real disadvantage other than, uh, of course, it takes you more time to make that personal connection. But to what good is it to quickly learn a bunch of scale boxes if you remember them, if you can't remember them, right? So uh, to me, there's either the right way of learning things or there's no way, there's no point in learning something if you're just gonna forget about it anyway. So yeah, that's, that would be my uh, key advice to you. Basically, start with one note and then add one note per day. That's a good thing. So, uh, you know, if you, maybe you know a few notes of the pentatonic scale. Why not add that Lydian or Dorian note? So, uh, so that could be just for one day, just add that one note. Try to make a personal connection with it. And trust me, you won't forget that note. And then you can add another note the next day. And those notes, they are gonna be, um, how, how to say, they're gonna be edged in your memory, is that a word? I don't know. Exactly, Ron. Muscle memory and ear sync, that's a good one. Good conclusion there. Cool, so I'm glad uh, I, you got the time to ask that last question. Oh, and we have yet another question by T Just Play. So you're also saving me from falling off the cliff here the last minute. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> I can't get any better at guitar theory and scale. What should I do? Cool, cool, cool. So um, I think the first question you need to ask yourself is, um, what is it you wanna achieve, right? Um, because basically you've already chosen your strategy and it turns out your strategy, you can't implement it. You can't implement it correctly. So uh, it could be a problem with the implementation, but it could also be the choice of strategy that is wrong. So what I'm trying to say is, I would like to know more, more about you. And I'm just gonna take a wild guess here and you just generally wanna get better at the guitar and you figure that going with, you know, uh, theory and scales is probably a good way to do it, right? Because that's what a lot of other people are doing, right? They're playing scales. Well, maybe not so much. They are playing scales, uh, but that doesn't mean it's the next uh, logic step for you to take now. On the contrary, I think, uh, you know, by this question, we can rather conclude that it's not a good strategy for you if you're struggling with it. Uh, because learning guitar shouldn't be a struggle. It should be fun, right? You learn when you're having fun. Shameless plug here, that's, you know, when I designed the site, that was my motto. I wanted to have fun when learning, and I knew that if others would have fun when learning, they would learn faster. So 
it's not working out for you. You're not having fun when you're practicing these scales uh, and uh, you're learning this theory and it doesn't work out for you. What do you do? You stop with it, right? Uh, most likely, you know enough theory right now to take you to the next step. And when you've taken that next step, when you've um, gone past that next threshold, then maybe learning a new scale is going to be easier. Or most likely, something is going to get easier as you move forward. So, the conclusion should be, figure out what next step for you is fun and doable. It could be learn a new song, it could be learn a new riff, it could be uh, some technique exercise, it could be a scale, though I would suspect it's not. It could simply be that you need to jam with a friend, or maybe you need to try to record a riff or a song, or maybe you need to jam with a backing track, which is what I do all the time, I love it. Uh, you can, I'm sure you can find a simple backing track and just maybe learn, try to see if you can find one note that works. Uh, you know, sometimes all you need is, uh, you know, I'm just gonna take this example here. You don't even have to know a scale, you can just use your ears, right? So it's like, yeah, uh, oh, that doesn't sound good. It's okay. Ah, oh, sounds bad. That sounds okay. So I had two notes that are okay. Oops, I need to refresh this one, I think. So I have two notes that are okay. Maybe you learn something from someone else who tells you, well, hey, let's not always use one finger, use two fingers. Well, I'm well on my way, right? These are small steps you can take. Then maybe you can try some hammer-ons, pull up. And then you can try on the next string. Ah, sounds bad. Oh, that sounds okay. So I learned a new spot, right? So that's the, the way you go about it. It's a slow exploration and making personal connection to those notes. That's how you progress. That's how you find a path that is manageable for you and not something which someone told you to do or something you read on the internet, whatever. Most of the time that kind of stuff doesn't work for you. You need to uh, sort of be your own guideline there and try to find stuff and try to evaluate not how it sounds when you're practicing, but rather, was it fun? Do I want to do it again? You know, it's most of the time it's that easy learning anything in life. Is it fun for you? Would you like to do it again? Good. Then you are going to do it again because it's going to be fun, right? And you want to do stuff that is fun. And the more fun something is, the more likely you're going to do it often. And the more often you do something, well, guess what? The better you're going to get at it. So I think break things down, keep it simple, make things simple, and don't learn scales if you're not inspired. That's most likely not your solution. Cool. So we got two awesome questions at the end. Thanks so much, guys. And uh, because you asked those questions, I'm just going to... Um, we have on the start page here, uh, If you, I've gathered like some of the most common questions I get, uh, and they're on this page. And I actually cover the exact same thing here in the need to learn theory part here. It's all free. Imagine so you, you knew... You can check it out here. And it's going to give you basically a lot of answers to these kind of questions. So let me just paste it for you guys here. There we go. That's, I think, is going to be a good one to, uh, to um, use. Cool. Duke is back. What were you up to? I get curious. You're teasing us and we, we don't know what you're up to. <laughs> okay, so where was I? Let's close this. Because we had so many... Oh, this, I think, is a cool one, maybe. Practice, do we have? Oh, this is a nice one. Jam track.
major to F minor, I think. <laughs> you gotta nail that. Change your key. Uh, I don't know why I did that. Oh, meds. Now we know, thank you. Mate, what guitar is that? So this is an RG. Oop, there we go. 652, 652 AHM. Uh, and um, it's, it's the one I end up playing most often. Um, I have a whole bunch of different guitars, nothing, you know, super fancy, but uh, the reason is because I find myself playing differently on different guitars. And it doesn't even have to be a good guitar that's playable, sometimes it's the opposite. You can grab that, you know, thick acoustic guitar and you can forget about doing all the sweeping and legato and stuff, whatever. You, maybe you just have to stick to doing simple melodies. Well, that's super good practice because those melodies are really what matters in the end anyway, and it pushes you to do something different. Because a lot of time when you're practicing on your own, maybe in your bedroom, whatever, and you don't get a lot of feedback, it's very easy to get stuck in your routines, and eventually that can lead you to getting stuck in a rut. And we don't want that, obviously, right? So um, what I recommend uh, you do, uh, or what I recommended myself to do, and which I did, <laughs> was to get some different guitars. Uh, just to play differently. But when I, when I do something where performance matters, I tend to go for this one, simply because uh, it's such a playable instrument, such a thin neck. And uh, yeah, it sounds really good, actually. Uh, sometimes you have to make a compromise between playability and, and tone, but not at all with this one. You know, it's a bolted neck and it has like a nice punchy tone. It has that a bright high end, but you can also get those. <laughs> smooth flowing leads, and you can get those. You know, it's, there's a lot of tones available there. So uh, yeah, this is a cool one. Cool guys, I mean, this was an amazing session. Couldn't even end it because we got so many cool questions there at the end. Um, I'm gonna try to get to my daughter in time now. She's gonna go to bed and uh, it would be a shame if I missed her before she falls asleep, but uh, I hope I'll see you at GMC, and if not, I hope I'll see you here uh, at YouTube or on Facebook. And be sure to hit all those alert less, uh, buttons, because otherwise you know how it works. You're going to miss the next stream. So you don't want to miss the next one, because I don't want to miss you. <laughs> I'll be missing you. Cool. Have a good one. Thanks so much for tuning in. Cheers.